हेलो एवरीवन एंड वेलकम टू पाइथन नाम पाई ट्यूटोरियल वीडियो बाय सिंपली लर्न पाइथन इज अ वर्सेटाइल प्रोग्रामिंग लैंग्वेज दैट अलोज यू टू परफॉर्म मल्टीपल टास्क एफिशिएंटली एंड एक्यूरेटली वन ऑफ पाइथन मेजर यूटिलिटीज इज इन द फील्ड ऑफ डेटा साइंस एंड एनालिटिक्स पाइथन इज नोन फॉर इट सिंपल सिंटेक्स एंड रीडेबिलिटी विच इज अ मेजर बेनिफिट ऑल्सो द जेंटल लर्निंग कर मेक इट स्टैंड आउट अमंग ओल्ड प्रोग्रामिंग लैंग्वेजेज विद कंपाइल सिंटेक्स Similarly, Python has over 200 modules to help developer reduce task and improve efficiency. One such module is the NumPy module in Python, which is used almost efficiently by every data professional out there. Be it data scientist or machine learning engineer or data analyst, it is very important for an individual to familiarize themselves with the capabilities of this module and utilize them in a day-to-day -day task as a data professional. With that being said, immerse yourself in the world of data-driven decision making through our intensive data science bootcamp. This comprehensive program is tailored for working professionals, offering live sessions led by esteemed instructors from Caltech. Engaging capstone projects and dedicated office hours to enhance your learning experience. Enroll now for our data science bootcamp, where you will gain a comprehensive understanding of the course concepts of data science. This immersive program covers a wide range of topics, including statics, Python programming, data analytics, machine learning, deep learning, neural language processing, data visualization tools, and much more. To know more about the course. Check out the course link in the description box below. Now, let's jump on to understanding what NumPy module is in Python. But before that, make sure to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon for regular updates. So, let's begin. What's in it for you? Well, today we're going to do part one of NumPy in a two-part series. Now, we're going to go over what is NumPy, installing and importing NumPy, NumPy array, NumPy array versus Python list, basics of NumPy, finding size and shape of any array, range and arrange functions, numpy string functions. And then in part two, I'll move on to cover axes, array manipulation, and much more. So let's start with what is numpy. Numpy is the core library for scientific and numerical computing in Python. It provides high performance, multi-dimensional array object and tools for working with arrays. And I'll go a step further and say there are so many other modules in Python built on NumPy. So the fundamentals of NumPy are so important to um, latch onto for the Python, so that you can understand the other modules and what they're doing. NumPy's main object is a multi-dimensional array. It's a table of elements, usually numbers, all of the same type, indexed by a tuple of position integers. In NumPy, dimensions are called axes. Take a one-dimensional array, or we have, and remember, dimensions are also called axes. You can say this is the first axis, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And you can see down here it has a shape of 6. Why? Because there's six different elements in it in the one-dimensional array. And they usually denote that as 6 comma with an empty node on there. And then we have a two-dimensional array where you can see 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And in here we have two axes, or two dimensions, and the shape is 2, 4. So if you were looking at this as a matrix or in other mathematical functions, you can see there's all kinds of importance on shape. We're not going to cover shape today, but we will cover that in part two. Did you know that NumPy's array class is called ND Array for NumPy Data Array? Now we're going to take a detour here because we're working in Python, and two of my favorite tools in Python is the Jupyter Notebook, and then I like to use that sitting on top of Anaconda. And if you flip over to jupyter.org, that's J-U-P-Y-T-E-R.org, you can go in here. You can install it off of here if you don't want to use the Anaconda Notebook. But this is the Jupyter setup, the documentation on the Jupyter. Jupyter opens up in your web browser. That's what makes it so nice is it's portable. The files are saved on your computer. They do run in IPython or Iron Python, And uh, you can create all kinds of different environments in there, which I'll show you in just a minute. I myself like to use Anaconda, that's www.anaconda.com. If you install Anaconda, it will install the Jupyter Notebook with the Anaconda separate. And you can install Jupyter Notebook and it will run completely separate from Anaconda's Jupyter Notebook. And you can see here I've now opened up my Anaconda Navigator. What I like about the Navigator, and this is a fresh install on a new computer, which is always nice, I can launch my Jupyter Notebook from in here, I can bring other tools, so the Anaconda does a lot more. And under environments, I only have the one environment, and I can open up the terminal specific to this environment. 
this one happens to have Python 3.7 in it, the most current version as of this tutorial. And then you open a terminal if you're going to do your pip installs and stuff like that for different modules. You can also create different environments in here. So maybe you need a Python 3.6, Python 3.5. You can see we're having a nice framework like Anaconda really helps. So you don't have to track that on your own in the Jupyter Notebook and your different Jupyter Notebook setups. We'll go ahead and launch this Jupyter Notebook. And then I've set my browser window for a default of Chrome. So it's going to open up in Chrome. And you can see here, this opens up a folder on my computer. We have a couple different options on here. Remember, I set the environment up as Python 3.7. You would install any additional modules that aren't already installed in your Python on this. And it keeps them separate, so you do have to, for each environment, install the separate modules so they match the environment on there. And in here, we have a couple things where you can look up what's running. You have your different clusters. Again, this is, I just installed this on a new machine, so I just have the one, a couple things in here that were run on here recently. And what we go on here is we then have on the upper right, new, and from the pull down menu, you'll see Python 3. And this will open up a new window. And now we're in Jupyter Python. So this is a Python window. We'll just do a print. And this, of course, is, let's go hello world. And we'll run that and it prints out hello world in the command line. There's a couple special things you have to know what we're not going to do today, which is on graphics. If you've never seen this, one of the things you can do is you can also do A equals hello world. And if you just put the A in there, now if you do a bunch of these where you have A equals hello world, B equals goodbye world, and you put A, B, A, then return B, it'll only run the last one. But you can see here, if you put the variable down here, it will show you what's in that variable. And that has to do with the Jupyter Notebook inline coding. So that's not basic Python, that's just Jupyter Notebook shorthand, which you'll see in a little bit. So back to our NumPy, NumPy array versus Python list. Python list being the basic list in your Python. Why should we use NumPy array when we have Python list? Well, first, it's fast. The NumPy array has been optimized over years and years by multiple programmers, and it's usually very quick compared to the basic Python list setup. It's convenient, so it has a lot of functionality in there that's not in the basic Python list. And it also uses less memory, so it's optimized both for speed and memory use. And let's go ahead and jump into our Jupyter Notebook. Since we're coding, the best way to learn coding is to code. Just like the best way to learn how to write is write, and the best way to learn how to cook is cook. So let's do some coding here today. And just like any modules, we have to import NumPy. We almost always import it as NP. That is such a standard. So you'll see that very commonly. We can just run that. And now we have access to our NumPy module inside our Python. And then the most common thing, of course, is to go ahead and create a NumPy array. And in here, we can send it a regular list. And so we'll go ahead and send this a regular array. Uh, let's go one, two, three to make it simple. And then I'm just going to type in A, and we'll run this. And so you can see down here, the output is an array of 1, 2, 3. And we could also do print, just a reminder that this is an inline command, so that wouldn't work if you're using a different editor. You can see that it's an array 1, 2, 3. But we'll go ahead and leave it as A. Kind of a nice feature so you can see what you're doing really quick in the Jupyter Notebook. And just like all your other uh, standard arrays, I can go A of 0, which is going to be a value of 1. Of course, we do a of 1, you go all the way through this. a of 1 has a value of 2 in it. So whether you're using the NumPy array or the basic Python list, that's going to be the same. That should all look pretty familiar and, and be pretty straightforward. Remember, the first value is always 0 and when we set on there. So let's take a look why we're using NumPy, because we went over the slide a little bit, but let's just take a look and see what that actually looks like. And what we want to look at is the fact that it's fast, convenient, and uses less memory. So let's take a glance at that in code and see what that actually looks like when we're writing it in Python and what the differences are. And to do this, I'm going to go ahead and import a couple other uh, modules. We're going to import the time module so we can time it. And we're going to import the system module so that we can take a look at how much memory it uses. And we'll go ahead and just run those so those are imported. And so we'll do b equals oh, range of 1... Yeah, 1,000 is fine. And so that's going to create a list of 1,000, 0 to 999. Remember, it starts at 0, and it stops right at the 1,000 without actually going to the 1,000. And let's go ahead and print. We want system.getSizeOf. 
and we'll pick any integer because we have you know zero to to a thousand. We'll just throw one in there, five. It doesn't matter because it's going to whatever integer we put in there is going to generate the same value because we're looking at the size of how how much memory it stores an integer in. And then we want to have the length of the B. That's how many integers are in there. And if we go ahead and execute this and run this at a line, we'll see. Oops, I did that wrong. Comma. If we multiply them together, we'll see it generates 28,000. So that's the size we're looking at is 28,000. I believe that's bytes. That sounds about right. So let's go ahead and create this in NumPy. And we'll go to C equals NP. And this is A range. So that's the NumPy command to do the same thing that we were just doing in a list. And we'll also use the same value on there, the 1,000. And then once we've created the uh, C um, value of C for NP.A range, let's go ahead and print. And we can do that by doing C.size times c dot item size. Well, that's very similar to what we did before. We did uh, get the size of, so the c size is the size of the array, and each item size. Just reversed. <laughs> so it's the size of an integer 5 item size is going to be the integers and c size. And let's just take a look and see what that generates. And wow, okay, we got 4,000 versus 28,000. That's a significant difference in memory, how much memory we're using with the array. And then let's go ahead and take a look at uh, speed. Let's do, um, oh, let's do size. We tried this with lower values, and it would happen so fast that the NP array kept coming up with zero. Because it just rounded it off. So size, and let's create an L1 equals range of size. And we'll do an L2. I'll just set up to the same thing. It's also range of size on there. There we go. And then we can do on A1 equals NP dot A range size. And then let's do on A2 equals NP dot A range. We'll keep it the same size. And what we're going to do is we're going to take these two different arrays and we're going to perform some basic functions on them. But let's go ahead, actually let's just load these up now. We'll go ahead and run this so those are all set in memory. Except for the typo here. Quickly fix that. There we go. So these are now all loaded in here. And let's do a uh, start equals time dot time. So it's just going to look at my clock time and see what time it is. And then we'll do result equals, and let's do, oh, let's say we got an array, and we're going to say, let's do some addition here, x plus y for x comma y, and then we'll zip it up here two different arrays. So here's our two different arrays. We're going to multiply each of the individual things on here. L1, L2. There we go. So that should add up each um, value. So L1 plus L2, each value in each array. And then we want to go ahead and print. And let's say uh, Python list took. And then we'll do time dot time. We'll just subtract the start out of there. So time, whoops, I messed up on some of the quotation marks on there. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Time minus the start. And we'll convert that to seconds. So we'll go uh, cause in milliseconds or times 1,000. And let's hit the run on there. This is kind of fun because you also get a view while we're doing this of some ways to manipulate the script. And as you can see also my bad typing. There we go. Okay, so we'll go ahead and run this. And we can see here that the Python list took 34 Actually, this is, I have to go back and look at the conversion on there. But you can see it takes roughly 0 0.34 of a second. And uh, we can go ahead and print the result in here, too. Let's do that. And we'll run that just so you can see what, the, what kind of data we're looking at. And we have the 0, 2, 4, 6, 8. So it's just adding them together. It looks pretty straightforward on there. And if we scroll down to the bottom of the answer, again, we see Python list took 46. A little different time on there, depending on what um, core 
because I have this is on an eight core computer, so it just depends on what core it's running on, what else is pulling on the computer at the time. And let's go back up here and do our start time. Paste that into here. And this time we're going to do a result equals, and this is really cool. Notice how elegant this is. It's so straightforward. This is a lot of reason people started using NumPy is because I can add the two arrays together by simply going A1 plus A2. It makes a lot of sense both looking at it and it's just very convenient. Remember that slide we're looking at? Fast, convenient, and less memory. So look how convenient that is. Really easy to read, real easy to see. And I don't know if we don't need to print the result again, so let's just go ahead and print the time on here. And we'll borrow this from the top part because I really am a lazy typer. And this isn't the Python list, this is the NumPy list, or NumPy array. And let's go ahead and see how that comes out. And uh, we get 2.99. So let's take a look at these two numbers, 46 versus 2.99. So we'll just round this up to three. That's a huge difference. That's, that's like more than 10 times faster. That's like 15 times roughly at a quick glance. I'd have to go do the math to look at it. And it's going to vary a little bit, depending on what's running in the background on the computer, obviously. So we've looked at this, and if we go back here, we found out it's much faster. Yes, there's different, going to be different speeds depending on what you're doing with the array. Very convenient, easy to read, and it uses less memory. So that's the core of the NumPy. That's why a lot of people base so many other modules on NumPy and why it's so widely used. So we did glance at a couple operations while we were looking at speed and size. Let's dive into a little bit more into the basic operations. I mean, these are always nice to see. I mean, certainly you want to go get a cheat sheet if you're using it for the first time. You know, look things up. Google is your friend. We did this with the most basic numpy.array or np.array. And uh, we'll go ahead and create an array. Let's do pairs, uh, 1, comma 2. And then let's do uh, 3, comma 4. And if we're going to do that, let's do 5, comma 6. There we go. And if we go ahead and take this and run this, I can go ahead and do our A down here so it's in line. It'll print that out. You can see it makes a nice array for us. So we have A, and if you look at that, we have three different objects, each with two values in them. And hopefully you're starting to think, well, how many dimensions or indexes is that? And you'll see three by two. So let's go ahead and take a look, and let's go, uh, how about A dot N dimensions? Speaking of which, we'll run that, and we have two dimensions for each object. And then we can do the item size, so A dot, we saw this earlier. We looked up how many items. It was up here where we wanted to multiply item size times the actual size of the object. So the memory is being used versus the item size. And we should see four there. Memory is compressed down. That's always a good thing. And then the shape. The shape is so important when you're working with data science and you're moving it from uh, one format to another. So we have our shape. We just talked about that. We have three by two three rows by two objects in each one. Generally, I don't look too much at the size, but the dimensions I'm always looking up. And this is nice, you can automate it. So you might be converting something, you might need to know how many dimensions are going into the next machine learning package so that you can automatically just have it send that information over. So we looked at A shape. Let's go ahead and create a slightly different array, np.array. Let's go ahead and just do as our original setup here. And one of the features we can do, which is really important, is we can do dtype equals, in this case, let's do np float 64. And so what we've done is we're converting all of these into a float. And we type in a. And now instead of having 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, you see they're all float values. 1 dot 0, there's no actual 0 in there, just there's a 1 dot or the one period, two, three period, four period, five period, six period. And this, again, data science, I don't know how many times I've had to convert something from an integer to a float so that's going to work correctly in the model I'm using. So very common features to be aware of and to be able to get around and use. And we'll also do, let's just curiosity, item size. We'll go ahead and run that. And we see that it doubled in size. So it's not a huge increase. Well, doubling is always a big increase in computers. 
but it's not a huge increase compared to what it would be if you're running this in the Python list format. And then we did the shape earlier without having it set to the float 64. Let's go ahead and do a shape with it set to 64. And it should be the same, 3, 2. So it all matches. So we've gone through, and remember, if you really, if this is all brand new to you, according to the Cambridge study at the Cambridge University, if you're learning a brand new word in a foreign language, the average person has to repeat it 163 times before it's memorized. So a lot of this, you build off of it, so hopefully you don't have to repeat it 163 times. But we did manage to repeat it at least twice here, if not a little bit more. And uh, let's go ahead and take this. We're going to go look at one more setup on here. And let me just take this last statement here on the converting our uh, properties of our data. And instead of float 64, let's do complex. Let's just see what that looks like. And let's go ahead and print that out and run it. And so we now have a complex data set up, and you'll see it's denoted by the 1.0.j. And if we flip over here and do a basic search for numpy data types, better to go to the original web page, but pull up a bunch of these. You can see there's a whole list of different numpy data types. Shorthand, complex, we have complex, complex 64, complex 128, complex number represented by 264-bit floats, real and imaginary components. One option on there, float 16, float 32, float, shorthand for float 64, most commonly used. And of course, all the different ones that you can possibly put into your NumPy array. So we covered a basic addition up there. We we're comparing how fast it runs. But some very basic components, how to set up a NumPy array, how many dimensions it has, item size, data type. Item Again, we went to item size. And there's also the shape. Probably one of the more used, I use a shape all the time, very commonly used. And then down here you can see where we actually created a NumPy complex data type. So let's look at some other features in NumPy. One of them is you could do NumPy dot zeros, and we're going to do 3 comma 4. There we go. And we'll go ahead and run this. And you can see if I do np.zeros, I create a numpy array of zeros. This is really important. I was building my own neural network, and I needed to create an array where I initialized the weights, and I want them all to be the same weight. In this case, I wanted them to start off as zero for the particular project I was working on. And there's other options, like you can do numpy1s. And we'll do the same thing, 3 comma 4. We'll run that. And you can see I've created a, an array of numpy ones. In this case, it comes out as a float array. And then this is an interesting to note because we have, let's go back to our Python and do L range 5. And we'll print the L. So that's our list. And if I run that, it doesn't create the range until after the fact, until you actually execute it. And that's an upgrade in Python. Python 2.7 actually created the array 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. This one actually creates the script, and then once it's used, it then actually generates the array. And if we do that in numpy a range, remember that from before, and if we do numpy a range 5, and let's do uh, l equals, or we can just leave it as numpy, that's fine. There we go, I'll just run that. You can see there we actually get an array, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 for the value of the numpy a range, a range 5. It generates the actual array. And for part one, we're going to do just one more section on basic setup. And we're going to concatenation, do a concatenation out example. There we go. We're going to do strings. Let's take a look at uh, strings and what's going on with there. And let's do, oh, let's see, print. Let's do an NP character, something new here. And we're going to add and then Here's our brackets for what we're going to add. Oh, and let's say, um, let's do hello, comma, hi. And in the brackets on there, let's create another one. And this one's going to be ABC. And we'll do XYZ. So we're just creating some, randomly making some up on here. And then we'll go ahead and just print this. If we run that and come down here. And, of course, make sure all your brackets are open and closed correctly. 
And then you can see in here when we concatenate the example in NumPy, it takes the two different arrays that we set up in there and it combines the hello with the ABC and the hi with XYZ. And if we can also do something like print, oh, let's do np character dot multiply. So there's a lot of different functions in here. Again, you can look these up. It's probably good to look them all up and see what they are, but it's good to also just see them in action. And let's do hello space comma three, and we'll run this one and run that without the error. And you'll see it does hello, hello, hello. So we multiplied it by three. And we can also, and let's just take this whole thing here instead of retyping it. And we can do character center. So instead of multiply, let's do center. And over here, keep our hello going. Take the space out of there. And let's do center at 20. And fill character equals, we'll fill it with dashes. So if we run this, you can see it prints out the uh, hello with dashes on each side. And we keep going um, with that. We can also, in addition to doing the fill function, we can play with capitalize, we can title, we can do lowercase, we can do uppercase, we can split, split line, strip, join. These are all the most common ones. And let's go ahead and just look at those and see what those look like, each one of them. Here we're going to do the hello world, all-time favorite of mine. I always like to say hello universe. And you can see here we did a capital H with the world, but so we want to capitalize. So capitalize is the first one in the array. So we get hello world on there. And we can also take this and instead of capitalizing, another feature in here is title. And let's just change this to how are we doing? How are you doing? Instead of we, we'll do do you. And let's run that. And you can see here, because we created it as a title, it capitalizes the first letter in each word. And in this one, we're going to do character lower. Two different examples here. We have an array. We have hello world all capitalized, and we have just hello. And you can see that one is an array and one is just a string. If we run that, you get a, an array with hello world lowercase and hello lowercase. And if we're going to do it that way, we can also do it the opposite way. There's also upper. And let's paste those in there. And you can see here we have character.upper opposite there. Python.data. And we'll do Python is easy. Hopefully you're starting to get the picture that most of the Python and the scripting is very simple. It's when you put the bigger picture together and it starts building these puzzles and somebody asks you, hey, I need the first letter capitalized. Unless it's the title. And then we have, you start realizing that this can get really complicated. So NumPy just makes it simple, and we like that. And so in this case, we did Python data. It's all uppercase. Python is easy, like shouting in your messenger. Python is easy. And then if you're ever uh, processing text and tokenizing it, a lot of times the first thing you do is we just split the text, and we're just going to run this, np.character.split. Are you coming to the party? And if we do that, it returns an array of each of the individual words. Are you coming to the party, splitting it by the spaces? And then if you're going to split it by spaces, we also need to know how to split it by lines. And just like we have the basic split command, we also have split lines. Hello, and you'll see here the scoop in for our new line. And when we run that, if you're following the split part with the words, you should see, hello, how are you doing? The two different lines are now split apart. And let's just review three more before we wrap this up commonly used string variable manipulations. We have strip, and in this case, we have Nina, admin, Anita, and we're going to strip A off of there. And let's see what that looks like. And then you end up with Nin, Demin, Nate. It basically takes up all leading and trailing letters. In this case, we're looking for A. More common would be a space in there, but it might also be punctuation or anything like that that you need to remove from your letters and words. And if we're going to strip and clean data, we also need to be able to reformat it or join it together. So you see here we have a character join. We'll go ahead and run this. And it has on the first one, it splits each of the letters up by the colon and the second one by the dash. And you can see how this is really useful if you're processing, in this case, a date. 
We have day, month, year, year, month, date. Very common things to be, have to always switch around and manipulate depending on what they're going into and what you're working with. And finally, let's look at one last character string. We're going to do replace. If you're doing misinformation, this is good. Pulling news articles and replacing is and what. In this case, we're just doing he is a good dancer. Um, we're going to replace is with was. And you can see here, he was a good dancer. Hopefully that's not because he had a bad fall. He just was from like, you know, 1920s and has gotten old. So there we go. We covered a lot of the basics in NumPy as far as creating an array. Very important stuff here when you're feeding it in. How do we know the shape of it, the size of it? What happens when we convert it from a regular integer into a float value as far as how much space it takes? We saw that that doubled it. Item size, you have your uh, in dimensions, and probably the most used is shape. And we'll cover more on shape in part two. So make sure you join us on part two because there's a lot of important things on shape in there and the setting them up. We also saw that you can create a uh, zeros based array. You can create one with ones. If we do a range, you can see how it is a lot easier to use to create its own range or a range as it is in NumPy. And you saw how easy it was to add two arrays. We saw that earlier, just plus sign. Then we got into doing strings and working with strings and how to concatenate. So if you have two different arrays of strings, you can bring them together. We also saw how you can fill, so you can add a nice uh, headline, dash, dash, dash. Uh, we saw about capitalize the first letter. We saw about turning it into a title, so all the first letters are capitalized. Doing lowercase on all the letters, upper for all the letters, just lower and upper. Nice abbreviation. We also covered how to split the character set, how to strip it. So if you want to strip all the A's out from leading A's and ending A's or spaces, you can do that very easily. Also, how to join the data sets. So here's a character join option for your strings. And finally, we did the character replace. We covered a lot in part one, Python NumPy. So last time we covered part one, where we went over the difference between the Python array and the NumPy array, and why it's both uh, easier to use, uses less memory and resources, and is also faster than the Python list. We also went over a number of the basic features in there, like looking up the min, the max, the median, how you can go ahead and create some very basic arrays, fill them all with zeros, fill them all with ones, look up the size, the shape. So we covered a lot. We covered a range, which is equivalent of Python, well, sort of the equivalent of Python list range. And then we looked a lot into characters, and working with the NP character and how to capitalize, center it, change it to a title, lowercase, uppercase, splitting, stripping, joining, and replacing characters. So what's in it for you? Today we're going to go over array manipulation. We're going to go over numpy, arithmetic operations, slicing arrays, iterating over arrays, array concatenation, splitting arrays, numpy histogram using matplotlibrary, and a few other useful functions in the numpy. And then we'll do a practice examples at the end. And hopefully you already got your Jupyter Notebook. I like to use it through Anaconda, but certainly you can just use a direct Jupyter Notebook. Now let's go ahead and dive in there since we're going right into part two, which is getting some coding going under our belt. And here in our Jupyter Notebook, we can go under New and create a new folder, Python 3. I think I forgot to do this last time, but we could just do the um, Control++, which in any browser enlarges a page, makes it a lot easier to see. Always a nice feature. Another beautiful benefit of using Jupyter Notebook. And let me go ahead and show you a, a neat thing we can do in Jupyter. This is nice if you're working with people and you're doing this as a demo on a large screen. I'm going to do the hashtag or pound symbol array manipulation. Kind of a title what we're working on. And then I'm going to call this cell, cell type, markdown as opposed to code. And you'll see it highlights it here. And then if I run it, it just turns it into array manipulation. And then we're specifically going to be working on array manipulation, changing shape to start with. And we'll go ahead and mark this cell also of markdown. So it has a nice little look there. And then it comes up, and you can see it just, like I said, it just highlights it and makes it in, very, in bold print, just making it easier to read. Not a Python thing, but a Jupyter thing that's good to know about, especially if you're working with the shareholders, since they're investing money in you. Of course, the first thing we do is import. We're going to import NumPy as in P, and that should be standard by now. By now you, you start a Python program, you're doing some data science, NumPy is just something you bring in there. And let's go ahead and create our array, and we're going to do that as the np.a range. Remember that's a zero, what well, we're going to do zero to nine, and then uh, we'll go print 
a little title on the original array. We'll just print that array A. Remember from the first lesson, so we have our array, which is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And let's add a print space in between. Let's create a second array, B, but we want this to reshape array A. And what does that mean? And the command is simply reshape. And then we have nine items in here, and this is so important right now. So be very aware, if I did some weird numbers in here, it's not going to work. And we want multiples of 9. We know that 3 times 3 is 9. So we're going to reshape our A array by 3 by 3. And then we're going to print. Well, let's give it a title. Oops, I had too many brackets in there. Modified array. And then let's go ahead and print our B. And let's see what that looks like. And as we come down here, you can see we've taken this and it's gone from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 to an array of arrays. And we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And so we split this into 3 by 3. And you can guess that if I tried to reshape this, let's just do a 5 by 3, which is 15, that's going to give me an error. So it's not going to work. You're not going to be able to reshape something unless the shape, all the, the data in there matches correctly. So we can take this, nine, this flat 9, and we call it a flat because it's just a single array. And we can reshape it into a 3 by 3 array. And first, you might think matrices, which this is used for that, definitely. I use it a lot in graphing, because it'll come in that I have an array that's xy, comma, x1, y1, comma, x2, y2. And so the shape of it might be 2 by the length of the number of points. And I need to separate that into a x flat array and a y flat array. And you can see this can be very easy to reshape the array doing that. And we can, of course, go back. We can do b do a print, and we'll do b dot flatten. Remember I said it's called a flatten array? And if we run that, you'll see it just goes back to the original one. It takes this 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and flattens it back to a single array. And then one other feature to be aware of is if we flatten it, one of the commands we can put in there is order. Let me just go ahead and do that. Order equals f. Strangely enough, f stands for Fortran, the whole Fortran days. I remember actually studying Fortran programming language. In this case, you'll see that it uses the first, like 0, 3, 6 is the order. So instead of flattening it like we had before, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, it now does 0, 3, 6, 1, 4, 7, 2, 5, 8. And if you go to the NumPy array page, you can see here that they have the flatten. I just open up the NumPy ND array flatten setup to look it up. And they have three different options. They have C, F, and A. And it's whether to flatten in C, which was based on how the C code works for flattening, or originally worked, which is row major, Fortran, which is column major, or preserve the column Fortran ordering from A. So whatever it was in, the default is the um, C version. So the default that you saw, you could put orders equals C, and it'd have the same effect as we saw there before. You could even do order equals A, that would also have the same effect because that's the default. So really, the only other thing you really need to change on here is to change it to C if you need it. And you can see right here, or F, I mean, not C. <laughs> the only thing you really want to change it to is to your F for the Fortran order, which then does it by column versus by row. And let's look at, here we go, reshape. So let's create a range of 12. And let's reshape it. And we'll do 4, 3 for this one. And uh, remember, this is numpy. I forgot the np there. np.arrange. And we can type in just a for print, or you can do full print a. And of course, the Jupyter Notebook even have a little extra print at the beginning. If we run this, we'll see we create a nice array of 0, 1, 2. It's reshaped it. So we have four rows and three columns, or you can call that three columns and four rows. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. But this one is so important. We'll do NP transpose A. And let's go ahead and run that. And it helps if I get all the S's in there and don't leave an S out. And you'll see here we've taken our array. If you remember correctly, we had 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. And we've swapped it. So we've gone from a 3 by 4 to, or a 4 by 3 to a 3 by 4. 
And this really helps if you're looking at like a huge number of rows and the data all comes in. Like let's say this is your features in row one, your features in row two, and this is X, Y, Z. Well, when you go to plot it, you send it all of X in one array, all of Y in one array, and all of Z in another array. And so it's really important that we can transpose this rather quickly. This is kind of a fun thing. I can highlight it and do brackets around it. And if you remember correctly, because we're in Jupyter, it doesn't matter whether we do the print or not. It'll automatically print it for us. And you see if I hit the Run button, it comes up with the same exact thing. Okay, and let's play with the reshape. And you know what? Let's zoom this up a little bit here. Make that even bigger so you can really see what's going on. And let's play with the reshape just a little bit more. We'll do B equals NP dot A range. Let's do 8. And reshape. We'll do 2 comma 4. Let's go ahead and uh, print B. And then run that. And you'll see we have now the two rows. This is a bit more like so we have four maybe two rows of four things, or this might be all of our X components and our Y components. So we can switch it back and forth real easy. Important to note here, whether we do two comma four, or in the case of four comma three, this has 12 elements. And so however you split it up, it's gotta equal 12. So four times three equals 12, that's pretty straightforward. Same thing down here. Two times four equals eight. Uh, if I change this, and let's say I do 2 comma 3, let's just run that in, and you'll find we get an error because you can't split 8 up into 2 rows by 3. You have to pick something that it can split up and arrange it in. So let's go ahead and run that. And just for fun, let's go um, reshape our B again, if I can type. Reshape our B again. And what else goes into 8? Well, we could do 2 by 2 by 2. So we can take this out to three different dimensions. And then, if, of course, if we, um, because this is going to come out you, you, as a uh, variable, we can just go ahead and run it, and it'll print it. We could also do a print statement on there, just like we did before. And you'll see we have two different groups of two variables of two different dimensions. So two by two by two. And let's go ahead and assign this to a variable, C equals B reshape. And let's do something a little different. Let's roll the axes. Roll axes. And we'll take our C and do 2, comma 1. And if we go ahead and run this, it's going to print that out. Whoops. Hit a wrong button there. Let's do that one again. And you roll the axes, and you can see that we now have, instead of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, we now have the 0, 2, 1, 3, 4, 6, 5, 7. So what's going on here? We're taking and we're rolling the numbers around. And let's just simplify this. We'll just do it with C comma 1 and run that. And so if we roll a single axis, you got 0, 1. And then it rolled the 4, 5 up. And then we have 2, 3, 6, 7. And if we do 2, let me see what happens there. And this is one of those things you really have to play with and start feeling what it's doing. We've now taken 0, 2. 4, 6, 1, 3, 5, 7. So you can see we've now rolled by two digits. Instead of um, rolling the one setup, we now rolled two digits up there. And so if we go back and we do the one, so we've rolled it up, 0, 1, 4, 5. And then we're going to take the two in there. And we've rolled the 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, 7. So we start rolling these things around on here. There's a lot of different things you can do on this. But it's another way to manipulate the numbers on your uh, numpy. And finally, let's go ahead and swap axes. We'll do C. And uh, let's just go ahead and run that. It's going to give me an error on there. That's because it requires uh, multiple arguments. Lift out the arguments. So now we can swap them. We get the 0, 2, 1, 3, 4, 6, 5, 7. So you can see everything's been swapped around. So next thing we want to go over is we want to go over numpy arithmetic operations. How can we take these and use these? Let me just go ahead and put this cell as a uh, markdown. There we go. We'll run that so it has a nice thing. All right, nice title on there. That's always helpful. And let's start by creating two arrays. We'll do uh, A is an EP, NP range, A range 9. And let's reshape this 3 by 3. So by now you should be seeing this reshape stuff and this should all look pretty familiar. We have our 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 on there. 
And let's create a second one, B. Okay, this time instead of doing A range, let's do NP array. We'll just create a straight up array. And we'll do an array of three objects. So it's going to be three by one. And if we go ahead and print a B out, let me run that. This is actually pretty common to have something like this where you have a three by whatever it is and a three by, by three array. When you're doing your math, you kind of have that kind of setup on there. And what we can do is we can go um, np.add ab. Don't forget, we can always put a print statement on there. So if we add it, you'll see that it just comes in there and it goes, okay, we're adding 10 to everything. And we could actually do something more, oh, make it more interesting, 11, 10, 11, 12. So let's change b. It's now 10, 11, 12. And let's run that. And you can see that we have 10, and then you had 1, plus 11 is 12, 2, plus 12 is 14, 13, so 10 plus 3 is 13, 11 plus 4 is 15, and 12 plus 5 is 17, and so on. We'll put this back, since that's how the original setup was. Let's do 10 by 10 by 10, and run that, and run that, and get the original answer. And if you're going to add them together, we need to go ahead and subtract A, B, and we run that. We get minus 10, minus 9, minus 8, just like you would expect. So we have our subtraction. 0 minus 10 is minus 10, and so on. And if you're going to add and subtract, you can guess what the next one is. We're going to multiply. And we'll multiply A, B. And this should be pretty straightforward. You should expect this. If we multiply uh, 10 times 0, we got 0. 10 times 10 is 10, and so on. And finally, if you're going to multiply, what's the last one we got is divide. What happens when we do divide A by B? And we run this, and we're going to get 0. And this is um, 0 divided by 10 is 0, 1 divided by 10 is 0 0.1, 2 divided by 10 is 0 0.2, and so on and so on. So the math is pretty straightforward. It just makes it very easy to do the whole setup. And again, if we went this, and let's say, uh, oh, let's change this up up here. Instead of 10, we do 100 and make this 1,000. There we go. And if we run that, and then we do the add, you can see we got 10 plus 100 plus 1,000. Same thing with the subtract. Same thing with the multiply. And then you can also see the same thing here with the divide. So a lot of control there with your array and your math. Again, let's set this back to 10. Oops, it's right up here, wrong section. There we go, 10. And we'll just go ahead and run these and get back to where we were. And this brings us to our next section, which is slicing. And let's put in our, uh, we'll just make this a cell, cell type, markdown. And then we run that. Of course, it gives us a nice looking slicing there. And the slicing means we're just going to take sections of the array. So let's create an array, np, a range. Well, let's just do 20. And if you remember, if we do a, we have a 0 to 19. And then we can do A, and remember that we can always print these. This can always be put in a print, but because I'm in Jupyter, if you're doing a demo in Jupyter, that is, it's just so great that you have all these controls on here. So we can slice 4 on, and this should look familiar because this is the same as a Python and a lot of other different scripting languages. If we do 4, it goes 0, 1, 2, 3, that's the first 4 in the thing, and it skips some and starts with this one. The first 4 are skipped, and then from there on. You can also do the opposite and go till the fourth one. If we run that, we get 0, 1, 2, 3. Quite the opposite on there. We can do a single item. So we can pick object number 5 on the list, run that. And uh, 5 happens to be 5 because that's the order they're in. And then this one's interesting because I can do S equals slice. And let's create a slice here. And let's do 2, comma 9, comma... Yeah, let's leave a 2 on there. So we'll create an S slice on here. And then if we take our array, and we do array of S, we're taking our slice in there, and let's go ahead and run that. And let's take a look and see what it generated here. First off, we started with 2, so we have 2 at the beginning. We're going to end at 9, which happens to be 8, so it stops before the 9. Remember when we're doing arrays in Python. And then we step 2, so 2, 4, 6, 8. We could do this as 3. Let me run that. And you can see how that changes. 2, 5, 8. And we could do this as, uh, let's leave this at 3. And if we change this to 10, oops, 
let's make it 12. There we go. And we run that, we have 25811. So that's pretty straightforward. It's a, a very nice feature to have on here where you can slice it and take different parts of the series right out of the middle. So now that we've accessed the different pieces of our array, let's get into iterating, iteration. And uh, this is interesting because my sister who runs a college data science division, the first question she asks is, how do you go through data? And she's asking, can you, do you know how to iterate through data? Do you know how to do a basic for loop? Do you know how to go through each piece of the data? And in NumPy, they have some cool controls for that. Let's see, put this thing as a markdown. There we go, and run it. And it's called the ND Iter. I'm not sure what the ND stands for, but ND Iter for iterator. So before we do that, though, let's create an array or something we can actually iterate through. We'll call it A equals NP A range. Let's do something a little funny here, or funky. And we'll do 0, 45, 5. I'm not sure why the guys in the back picked this particular one. It's kind of a fun one. And if I run that, we do this, you can see um, we get 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40. That's what this array looks like. And that's just from our slice. You could, this is just a slice. That's all that is, is we created a slice of 0, 45, 0 to 45, step 5. And so we can do with this, we can also do A equals reshape. Let's go ahead and take and reshape this. And since there's nine variables in there, we'll do a reshape at three by three. Uh, so if we run that, oops, missed something there. That is the A. <laughs> that really helps. Uh, so if we do the A reshape, and we'll go ahead and print that out, we get 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40. And then we simply do 4xn. Our numpy nd iter of a colon, and we'll just go ahead and print x. And let's see what happens here when we run through this and we print each one of those. It goes all the way through the whole array, so it's the same thing we just saw before. We got 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40. So it prints out each object in the array, so you can go through and view each one of these. And certainly, if you remember, you could also flatten the array and just do for A and that also and get the same result. There's a lot of ways to do this, but this is the proper way with the ND iterator because it'll minimize the amount of resources needed to go through each of the different objects in the NumPy array. And hopefully you asked this question when I just did that. And the question is, how can I change this instead of doing each object? So first of all, let's go ahead and take my cell type, and we're going to mark that down, run it. And so we're going to work on iteration order C style and F style. Remember C because it came from the C programming, and F because it came from the old Fortran programming. So let's give us a reminder. Uh, we'll do a print A, and we'll do 4xn np iterate A. But we also want to do this in a specific order. And you know what? I'm a, a really lazy typer, so let's go back up here. This is the ND iterator. I knew I was missing the ND part of A. And let's do order equals C. We'll print X on there. And let's do that again. And this time, order, order equals F. There we go. Order equals F. Let's go ahead and run this and see what happens here. And the first thing you're going to notice, our original array, 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40. And when we do order C, that's the default, 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, and so on. And then when you come down here, you'll see F, order F, is 0, 15, 30. So it takes the first digit of each of the subarrays, or the second dimension, and then it goes into the second one, 5, 20, 35, 10, 25, 40. So a slightly different order for iterating through it if you need to do that. So we've covered reshaping, we've covered math, we've covered iteration, we've covered a number of things. The next section we want to go ahead and go over is going to be joining arrays. So we need to bring them together. Let me go ahead and take the cell and make it a markdown. Cell type. Markdown. There we go. And run that. So let's work on joining arrays so we can bring them together and, and what different options we have. And let's do, um, we'll do an NP array 1, 2, comma, 3, 4. 
we'll go ahead and print. Let's do oops. First. Now these rays aren't that big, so let's just go ahead and keep it all on one line, A. So if we run this, first array, one, two, three, four. Whoops, I forgot that it automatically wraps it when you do it this way. So we'll go ahead and keep it separate and print A. There we go. And let's go ahead and do a B. And we'll do five, six, seven, eight. And notice I'm keeping the same shape on these two arrays. Depending on what you're doing, those shapes have to match. And let's go ahead and print second array. Do a print B. We'll go ahead and run that. Oops. Missed something up there. Let me fix that real quick. When I was reformatting it to go on separate lines, I messed that up. There we go. Run. All right, so we have first array one, two, three, four, second array five, six, seven, eight. And we'll put a carried return on there. And the keyword we use is um, concatenate. And if you're familiar with Linux, it usually means you're adding it to the end on there. And we're going to do what they call long axis zero. So we have concatenate AB along axis zero. Let's go ahead and run that and see what that looks like. And so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So now we have an array that is four by two has a nice shape of four by two on here. And if we're going to do it along the axis zero, you should guess what the next one is. We're going to do it along the one axis. And let's see how those differ from each other. Let's just go ahead and run that. And again, all we're doing is adding in the axis equals one. So we have our concatenate, we have a, b, and then axis one. Remember a couple things. One, these are the same shape. So we have a two by two, same dimensions going in there. You're going to get an error if you're concatenating and they're not, if you have something that instead of 1, 2 is uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 with a 5, 6, 7, 8. They'll give you an error on there. In fact, let's take a look and see what happens when we do that. Let me just take this. 1, 2, 3, 3, 4, 5. And let's run that. And if we come down here, oh, we got there. It says all the input array dimensions except for the concatenation axes M must match exactly. So it'll let you know if you mess up. That's always a good thing. Let's go ahead and take this back here. And let's go ahead and run that. And so we have our zero axes, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And we bring them together. And you'll see a very different setup here when we do it along the axes 1. We end up with, instead of a 4 by 2, we end up with a 2 by 4. 1, 2, 5, 6, 3, 4, 7, 8. And that's just changing which axes we're going to go ahead and, and concatenate on. What I find is when you're talking about the concatenate or the um, joining arrays, you really got to play with these for a while to make sure you understand what you mean by the axes. It looks very intuitive when you're looking at it. Axes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Axes 1 is then splitting it a different way. 1, 2, 5, 6, 3, 4, 7, 8. When you're actually using real data, you start to really get a feel for what this means and what this does. So if we're going to do that, let's go ahead and look at splitting the array. And uh, do that under Markdown and run it. There we go. So you have a nice little title there. And we'll go ahead and create an array of nine. Let's do NP split. We'll do A, and we're going to split it by three. Let's just see what that looks like. So if we split it, we get an array 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We get three separate arrays on here. Now remember, we're looking at, let me just print A up here. So we're looking at 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And then we can split it into three separate arrays. And let's take this. We're going to do this right down here. Let's move the A split down here. Instead of the 3, let's do 4, 5. And put that in brackets. And so when we do it this way, we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And that's kind of interesting. I, I wasn't sure uh, what to expect on that, but we get, when you split an A by 4, 5, you get a totally different setup on here as far as the way it split the array. And to understand how this works, I'm going to change the 5 to a 7. And this will visually make this a little bit more clear. So we had 4 and 5, it went 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 
and you see the markers 4 and 5. When we do 4 and 7, I get 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And so what you're looking at here is the first markers. This is going to go to 4. So there's our first split at the 4, the marker of 4. And then the second split is going to be at position 7. And this is the same thing here. 4, position 5. That's why we're splitting it in those two sections. We could also do it 7. Let's just see what that looks like. Run. And you can see I now have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So we can split it in all kinds of different arrays and create a different set of um, multiple arrays on here and split it all kinds of different ways. And before we get into the graphs and other um, miscellaneous stuff, let's go ahead and look at resizing the array. I'll go ahead and take this cell and set the cells a markdown and run it. Give us a nice title there. And we'll do an array, uh, an NP array of uh, 1, 2, 3, and 4, 5, 6 here. And let's go ahead and just print. Let's go print a dot shape. And we'll go ahead and run that. Whoops, hit a wrong button there. Hit the comma instead of the dot. So we have a shape of 2, 3 here. And this is important to note because when we start resizing it, it's going to mess with different aspects of the shape. And so we'll go ahead and do a print. Oops, scoop in for a blank line. There we go. Now let's do b equals np dot resize. We're going to resize a, and let's resize it with three by two. And then we'll just go ahead and print b and print b period shape, not a comma. We'll run that. Oops, forgot the uh, quotation marks around the end. We'll go ahead and run that, and let's just see what that looks like. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, our original array, with a shape of 2, 3. And then we want to go ahead and resize it by 3, 2. And we end up with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and we end up with a shape of 3, 2. That shouldn't be too much of a surprise. You know, we got six elements in there. We can resize it by two, three was the original one. And then we're actually just reshaping it is how that kind of comes out as when you resize it like that. But what happens if we do something a little different? And let's go ahead and just take this whole thing and copy it down here so we can see what that looks like. And instead of doing three, two, remember last time I did the, um, to reshape it, I messed with the numbers and it gave me an error. Well, when you resize it, you don't have to match the numbers. They don't have to be the same dimensions. So we, we can, instead of going from a 2, 3 to a 3, 2, we can resize it to a 3, 3. So let's take a look and see how it handles that. And when we come down here to 3, 3, we end up with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and it repeats 1, 2, 3. So it actually takes the data and just adds a whole other block in there based on the original data and repeating it. All right, now at this point, you know, we've been looking at tons of numbers and moving stuff around. What we want to go ahead and do is get a little visual here because that, um, certainly you can picture all the different numbers on there. But let's look at histogram. Let's put this into a histogram. Let me go ahead and run that. And to do that, we're going to use the matplot library. So from matplot library, we're going to import pyplot as plt. And that's usually the notation you see for pyplot. So if you ever see plt in a code, it's probably pyplot in the matplot library. And then the guys in the back did a nice job, and gals too, guys and gals back there. <laughs> Our team over at Simply Learn put together a nice array for me, uh, 20, 87, 4, 40, 53, with a bunch of numbers. That way we had something to play with. And what we want to do is we want to do uh, plot the histogram. Now remember a histogram says how many times different numbers come in. And then we're going to put them in bins. And we have bins 0 to 20 to 40 to 60 to 80 to 100. You might in here with the um, matplot library they call them bins. You might hear the term buckets where they put them in buckets. That's a really common term. And then we want to give it a title. So the way it works is you do your plt.hist for histogram, your plt title, and your PLT show, and we're doing just a single array in here in the numpy array of A. And let's go ahead and run this piece of code. 
taking a moment to come out there. So it's figure size, so it's generating the graph. And you can see we have, and let's just take a look at this. Let me go down a size. There we go. Okay, so now we can see we're taking a look at here. So between 0 and 20, we have three values. So we have a 20 here, we have a 4, and a 11, and a 15. 0, 1, 2, 3. It's actually four values, but they start at zero. So remember, we always count from zero up. And from 20 to 40, we got 20. So it's 1, 42, 3, 4, 5, 6. And so you can see in the histogram, it shows that the most common numbers coming up is going to be between the 40 and 60 range, least common between the 80 and 100. This looks like an age demographics is what this looks like to me. And you can see where they would have put it in the buckets of different age groups, which would be a nice way of looking at this. Histograms are so important and so powerful when you're doing demos and explaining your data. So being able to quickly put a histogram up that shows what's common and how it's trending is really important. And using that with a numpy is really easy. And you know what, let's take the same data, and I want to show you why we do bins, or why we have buckets of data. I'm used to calling it buckets. Why we have bins. Let's do it instead of by 20, let's do it by 10s and see what happens. And what happens when you do it by 10s is you miss out on the, you can see a nice curve here on the first one, and on the second one it looks like a ladder going up and a plummet, a ladder going up and a plummet and a ladder going down. So the first would be more indicative of an age group, and the second one would be what you would get if you divided incorrectly. You wouldn't see the natural trend of, I don't know what this would be, maybe how much food they eat. Hopefully not, because I'm in, in 50, so I'm right in the middle there, which means I eat a ton of food compared to everybody else. But it's some kind of demographic. Maybe it's mental. Maybe it's knowledge, because we, we hit a certain point, and then we start losing our marbles, start leaking out or something. So you start off knowing something, and then as you get older, you grow more. But you can see here we lose that. You lose that continuity in the thing if you split the histogram into too many bins or too many buckets. And if you actually plotted this by the individual numbers, it would just be a bunch of dots on the graph and wouldn't mean a whole lot. And we've looked at graphs. There, turns out, are a ton of useful functions in NumPy. I'm sure there's even new ones that are, aren't going to be in here. But let's just cover some important ones you really need to know about if you're using the NumPy framework. One of them is line space function. This is generating data. So we have a line space. We have 1, 3, 10. And when we do that, we end up with 10 numbers. So if you count them, there's 10 numbers. They're between 1 and 3, and they're evenly spaced. We get 1, 1.222. 1 but these are all, there's a total of 10 here, and it's right between the 1 and 3 range. That can be, there's a lot of uses for that, but they're probably more obscure than a lot of the other common NumPy array setup. But a real common one is to do summation. So we'll do summation where you do, in this case, we create a NumPy array of one of um, two different arrays, one, two, three, or two different dimensions, one, two, three, three, four, five. And we're going to sum them up under axes zero, which is your columns. And if you remember correctly, columns is the 1 plus 3, 2 plus 4, 3 plus 5, so we have three columns. And if we change this, we'll just flip this to 1, we get two numbers. So we get 1, 2, 3 all added together, which equals 6, and 3 plus 4 plus 5, which equals 12. We'll set this back to 0. There we go, since it's, uh, since we're looking at actually 0. And these probably could have been, some of these could be underneath our math uh, section. Square root and standard deviation, two very important tools we use throughout the machine learning process and data science. And simply, we take the NP array. We have, again, the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 3, 4, 5. I don't know why I need to keep recreating it. I probably could have just kept it. But we can take the square root of A. So it goes through, and it takes the square root of all the different terms in A. And we can also take the standard deviation, how much they deviate in value on there. And there's a rabble function. We can run that. And in P array is x, we're going to do x equals, hey, we changed it from a to x. x equals rabble. And this sets it up as columns. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This is all columns on here. Very similar to the flatten function. So they kind of look almost identical. But we also have the option of doing a rabble by column. 
And then another one is log. So you can do mathematical log on your array. In this case, we have one, two, three. And we'll find the uh, log base 10 for each of those three numbers. And there's a couple of them. They don't, you can't just do any number here after log, but there is also log base 2. Log base 10 is pretty commonly used on here. I'm going to run that. There we go. Before we go, let's have a little fun. Let's do a little practice session here on some more challenging questions. So you start to think how this stuff fits together. Right now we just looked at all the basics and all the basic tools you have. So let's do some numpy practice examples. And let's start by figuring out how do you plot, say, a sine wave in numpy? How, what would that look like? And so in this project, we wouldn't have to do this because I've already run these. But we'd want to go ahead and import our numpy as np and import our matplot library pyplot as plt. So we get our tools going here. And then we'll break it into two sections because we need our x, y coordinates in here. So first off, let's create our x coordinates. And our x coordinates, we're going to set to an a range. And we want this error a range, since we're doing sine and cosine, it's going to be between 0 and 0.1. And then we use our np, and we actually can look up numpy stores pi. So you have the option of just pulling pi in there directly from numpy. It has a few other variables that it stores in there that you can pull from there. But we have numpy pi. And we generate a nice range here. And let's go ahead and run this. And just out of curiosity, let's see what x looks like. I always like to do that. So we have 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. So we're going uh, 0 to, in this case, 9.4, three times numpy pi. Remember that pi is like three point something, something, something. So that makes sense. It should be about 9. And we're doing intervals of 0 0.1. So we create a nice range of data. And then we need to create our y variable. And so y is going to simply equal np or numpy.sign of x. And then once we have our x and y, and if we print, let's go ahead and just print y. See how that, we'll do this, let's do this so it looks print x, print y. So we basically have two arrays of data. So we have like our um, x axes and our y axes going on there. And this is simply a plt.plot, because we're going to plot the points. And we'll do x, comma, y. And then we want to actually see the graph, so we'll do plot.show. And we'll go ahead and run that. And you see we get a nice sine wave. And here's our number 0 through 9. And here's our sine value, which oscillates between minus 1 and 1, like we expect it to. Then for the next challenge, Let's create a 6x6 two-dimensional array and let 1 and 0 be placed alternatively across the diagonals. Oh, that's a little confusing. So let's think about that. We're going to create a 6x6 two-dimensional, so the shape is 6x6 two-dimensional array, and let 1 and 0 be placed alternatively across the diagonals. Now, if you remember from lesson 1, we can fill a whole numpy array with zeros or ones or whatever. So we're going to do np, I'll create a numpy zeros, and we're going to do a 6 by 6, and we'll go ahead and make sure it knows it's an integer, even though it's usually the default. And just real quick, let's take a look and see what that looks like. So if I run this, you can see I get 6 by 6 grid, so 6 by 6, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Now, if I understand this correctly, when they say 1's and 0 placed alternatively across the diagonals, they want the center diagonal, maybe that's going to stay 0 all the way down. And then the next diagonal will be 1's all the way across diagonally. And then the next one zeros, the next one 1's, and the next one zeros, and so on. Hopefully you can see my mouse lit up there and highlighting it. So let's take a little piece of code here. And we'll do Z. 1 colon colon 2 comma colon colon 2 equals 1. And, wow, that's a mouthful right there. So let's go ahead and run this and see what that's doing. And so what we're doing is we're saying, hey, let's look at, in this case, row 1. There's 1. And then we're going to go every other row 2. So we're going to skip a row. So skip here, skip here, skip here. So we're going down this way. And we're going every other row going this way. It's hard to highlight columns. <laughs> so you can see right here where the, the we're not touching each row. Like this row right here is not being touched. Okay, so we're going to start with row 1. 
and then we're going to skip a row and another one and so we're going every two rows and then in every two rows we're looking at every two starting with the beginning that's what this thing blank means so we're going to start with the beginning and we're going to look at all of them but we're going to skip every two so starting with row one we look at all the rows but we do we do it by two steps so we go one skip one uh, you know one skip one one skip one one if you left this out it'd do every one this would just be ones in fact let's see what this looks like if i go like this and run it you can see that i guess get ones so this notation allows us to go down each row row by row and we're going to do every other row set up on there and so if we're going to start with row one we also control z try that there we go we'll start with row zero again we're going to go each row step two so we'll start with row zero and we'll go every other row and this time we'll start with one column one and again we go every other one going down Step that's what that step two is, is skipping every other one. We're going to set that equal to one. So let's see what that looks like. And you can see here we get our answer. We get zero one one zero zero, but it has the ones going in diagonals on every other diagonal and zero on every other one. A little bit of a brain teaser that one, trying to get that one to work out. So you can see how you can arrange your rows, and here's your step and your different access on there. And then the next one is find the total number and locations of missing values in the array. The first challenge is to create some missing numbers. So let's create our array z. We're going to do a numpy.random.rand 10 comma 10. And before we do the second part, let me just take the second part out. And let's just see what that looks like. So let's run that. And there we go. So we have a 10 by 10 random array. It randomly is picking out numbers. And next, we want to go ahead and take our random integer size equals 5. And then we're going to do a random random 10 size equals 5. So in the Z, we're going to select a number of random spaces here and set them equal to null value. And let's go ahead and run that so you can see what that looks like. And if we look at the array, we've created 1, 2, three, four, there should be a fifth one in here. My eyes may be failing me. So we've created a series of, oh, because zero, zero to five, zero, one, two, three, four. So we got five, there are different null values on here. And this is kind of a neat notation to notice that we can generate random integers, size equals five. So this generates five by five miniature grid inside of this to tell it where to put the NANDs at. So that's kind of a cool little thing you can do. And then we want to look up and see how many null values are in there. And this is simply just np is nan of z. Simple. So if it is nan, then we want to sum it up. So we're going to sum up all of the different null values on there. And let's do one, one more feature in here, which is really cool. Let's go ahead and print the indexes. So np argware np is nan of z. So we're going to create our own another np array. Let's run this, and we'll see here that it comes up with the four indexes. So we did count four of them up there. It tells you where they are, 19204654. And then let's go ahead and run this again. Run, run, there we go. This time I got five. That's what we get for random numbers. Another fun one that I always like to do, it's very similar, because we have np is nanz.sum. So we're summing the number of... NANs. And we can get the indexes and you can reshape the indexes. But you can also just do, we'll do an INDS where NP is NAN of Z. And let's just print, let's print that. Print INDS. Let's see what that looks like. And it's very similar to what we have. We have 01306386693. But I've split it into two different arrays. So we have our X and our Y kind of coordinates going there. And what I can now do is I can now do Z I N D S equals. And at this point, you can also, instead of getting the sum, you can get the means or the all well, the numbers and that kind of thing, you have, or the average as it is. So that'd be one thing you could do. And you can pick up the average. 
That's very common in data science to get the average and just use that for a value. But we'll go ahead and just set it to zero. And then let's go ahead and print our Z and run that. And you can see we come down here, we have wherever there was a null value, it is now zero. And you can set this to whatever you want. This is another way to replace data or help clean data up, depending on what it is you're doing. So, wow, we covered a lot of stuff. So a quick rehash going over everything. We went into there, we looked at array manipulation, changing the shape, um, how to switch that around. We even had the flatten down there, which remember we have another command lower that's similar. We could change the order by F. Remember F stands for Fortran, very strange connotation, but there's C and F. C is the standard, and F switches it to a different order. To be honest, I usually have to look it up because I almost never use F. But when you need it, you're like, oh my gosh, it was the other order. Just do a quick Google. So we talked about reshape, making sure that the dimensions are the same. You don't want to have like a, something that has 12 objects in it and reshape it to 11 and 5 because it doesn't work. It doesn't divide into 12. We can transpose so we can switch them. So we can go from a 4x3 to a 3x4. Oops, I did that the other way around. 3x4 to 4x3. We covered reshaping the array. We did the roll the axes. You can do some weird things with swapping and rolling axes and transposing the numbers. We dug a little bit into the arithmetic. So we talked about adding, we talked about subtracting, multiplying, dividing. And, you know, at this point, it's so important we just look up the numpy mathematics. And you can see here they have just about everything. Your trigonometry, uh, your hyperbolic functions, rounding, sums, products, differences. There is so many, all your different miscellaneous mathematical connotations. So, you know, Google it, go to the main numpy page and look at the different setups you can do on there. So we covered that. And we did slicing, how to break it apart. We did iterating over the array. We covered joining arrays and how to concatenate. Remember, concatenate just means add on to it. So in this case, how are you adding B onto A is how you read that. From Linux, you should catch the concatenate because that's used regularly there. Splitting the array, we talked about how to split the array in different ways. So you can split it in an um, array of arrays, all kinds of different ways to split the array up. How to resize it. And remember, resize does not have to have the same shape. But if you resize it, it will take the data and begin at the beginning and add new rows on if the size is bigger. If it's smaller, it truncates it. It just cuts the end off. We looked at how to do a histogram and how to plot that. Uh, we mentioned bind buckets or bins, as they call them in uh, PyPlot. And then we covered a lot of other useful functions in NumPy. We talked about the line space setup for doing um, numbers in a series, how to sum the axes up, Again, that's part of the mathematical formulas there that we looked at. There's a sum, there's also means and median. All of those you can compute in NumPy. And you can also do the square root and standard deviation. The Ravel function, very similar to the flatten. To be honest, I almost always just use the flatten. But, you know, the Ravel has its own kind of functionality that it does. And then we went into some NumPy practice examples. We challenged you to create a sine wave in NumPy and how to do that. We're kind of looking for that A range. Remember how we do the A range? And you can have your uh, beginning value, your end value, which they did as three times pi, numpy pi. And we're going to do intervals of point 0.1. And then Y just equals the numpy sine of X. There's our math from the math page we were just looking at. Remember that? It's right at the top. And uh, finally, we went down here. We had this kind of a little brain teaser how to do diagonal zeros and ones. Playing with the different connotations of Z of the uh, NumPy array. And then we did a random size and we played a little bit with how to, with the null values, playing with null values. If you're doing any data science, you know null values are like a headache. What do you do with them? Big sets of data, you get rid of them. Small de sets of data, you have to factor something in there, like figure out the average or, or the uh, median there and then replace it with that. So with that, we want to go ahead and wrap this up. And I want to thank you for joining me today. Staying ahead in your career requires continuous learning and upskilling. 
Whether you're a student aiming to learn today's top skills or a working professional looking to advance your career, we've got you covered. Explore our impressive catalog of certification programs in cutting edge domains, including data science, cloud computing, cybersecurity, AI, machine learning, or digital marketing. Designed in collaboration with leading universities and top corporations, and delivered by industry experts, choose any of our programs and set yourself on the path to career success. Click the link in the description to know more. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.